Fire one! Fire two! It's a hit! Ha ha! Periscope down! Hello and welcome to today's video where you just see me sinking at the ship. But it's up to you to stop me because today we're looking at no less than, not one, not two, but three games, all called Sub Hunt. All of them involve hunting down submarines in the North Sea. All of them a bit different. We look at them how they are originally, then we'll try to make them better. Or, you could just let me win. <laughs> this is James Mead's Sub Hunt, which is from 15 Graphic Games for the Spectrum by Richard G. Hurley. You are the captain of the small anti-submarine cruiser HMS Spectrum, which has been ordered to seek out and destroy all enemy submarines in the sea surrounding your country. The ship is armed with two Mark II sea mortars, which are capable of throwing depth charges both in front of and behind the ship. Due to the slow loading sequence, only one depth charge can be fired from either mortar at any one time, and this will automatically explode on contact with a submerged object or the sea bottom. Unfortunately, the enemy submarines, which may be at varying depths and travelling in either direction, are armed with sub-to-surface missiles, which, when fired, travel vertically upwards, exploding when they break the surface of the water. As captain, you have three ships at your disposal, with which to sink as many enemy submarines as possible. The points you score for each kill depend on the stage of the battle and the depth of the submarine destroyed. The game gets progressively more difficult, with the number of enemy ships and their firing rate increasing all the time. This is Sub Hunt. You press 5 to go left, 8 to go right. 1 um, fires a depth charge from the front of the ship, the back of the ship, or the left-hand side of the ship, ports perhaps, and 2 from the right-hand side of the screen. So here I've moved left, and you drop there. So there is no sound at all. It moves very nicely. Unfortunately, when you destroy the submarine sometimes, you get the front of the submarines left behind. I'm not quite sure why that is. I've double-checked the code multiple times. Double-checked, triple-checked, quadruple-checked, whatever. And it's... I can't quite puzzle that out. I think the problem is the submarine's moved, and then it doesn't quite work out putting the spaces in place. So I think we can probably make, fix that, make it slightly better. However, it's a good, fast little game. When the submarines are close to the top, they force the, you have much less time to react. The good news is there's no penalty to letting submarines uh, go by. No sound. But you get a nice little flash effect when the, when the explosion happens. The user-defined graphics are nice. You've got a nice clear sky and sea and the line between them, which is just the underscore character, but it works nicely. The missiles move quickly. It, it moves efficiently. It also fits comfortably into the 16K machine as well. So if you were a very early adopter of the ZX Spectrum, only had 16K, you had this. Don't forget the 16K Spectrum had less available RAM than the 16K ZX81 because of the high definition screen. So here there, I've got a bit of explosion left over the middle of the screen. You can download this version from Spectrum Computing. It's marked as done by Richard, Richard G. Hurley, who of course did the entire book, but it's done by his students. I'm dead, new high score, which I like another game. The deeper the submarines are, the more score you get. I think we can make this better. Add a few bits of Bob, but stay within 16k. We're now looking at games of action and excitement for your ZX Spectrum. It's Sub Hunt. Welcome, Commander, to your next mission. In this graphic game from John Hall, you are in charge of a submarine lurking somewhere in the North Sea. Your mission is to destroy as many of the enemy submarines as you can. You must aim for their periscopes. Take warning, they dive at random. You should only fire when they are, at, they are in the centre of your sights. The 1 will move your sights left, the 0 will move them right. Use the I key to fire. So, we actually have sound. A little view out of our, our periscope. And we get to move left and right. There is the, the waves and little beeps. The periscope pops up. Once it pops up and in the middle of the screen, you press I 
Do it fast enough. Do it fast enough. And you shoot them. And you get a point. You have your number of torpedoes at the bottom of the screen. And it's very twitchy. Because obviously you're in, you're in the waves. The submarines are moving around. You're all being bobbed around by the waves. It's a bit tricky. And they don't often stay up for long. Also, the exact middle of the screen is a bit, can be a bit hard to find. Because you don't have any crosshairs. Which is fair enough. Um, but if you see roughly where you are, it makes it more of a challenge. Once you fire, oh, your ammo goes down, your little beep. Line gets drawn, which is the track of your torpedo. That's another one gone, thanking you. There's a lot of submarines about. This is, as TV tropes have it, hot sub on sub action. Dude. So there, your arrow is seven. Left a bit, right a bit. The, you have three different user defined graphics for the waves. One for the enemy submarine's periscope, which is obviously pointing at you. They're never far back, though, because obviously uh, they're obviously cowards, not like us, heroically shooting them. Up to no good, those enemy submarines. You can't trust them. You can't. Left we go. Come on. Come on. Oh, no. Miss. Where are you? Oh, bit to the right. The bearing at the top changes. Bit to, come on. There's obviously there's no landscapes you're at sea. All you get is the endless, endless, what was the other miss? The endless waves. So I rather like this one. It's not. It's good, simple fun. Again, fits into the 16K machine. So don't expect silent service. And at the end of the game, you run out of ammo, put any key to play again, and that's what you get. So I think here, there is room to make it better. This is Sub Hunt from the Giant Book of Spectrum Games. This one is from Andrew Turner, who was born in Liverpool in 1967 and is currently working towards his A levels in maths, further maths, physics, and chemistry. Although that was certainly the case in 1984. The object of this game is to score as many points as you can in the allotted time, 100 seconds. You must move your destroyer over the surface of the water. As you move, a submarine will begin to cross the screen from left to right. Place your destroyer somewhere in front of the submarine and drop a depth charge. Points are scored when you hit the submarine. If you hit the submarine on the extreme left of the screen, you'll score more points if you hit it in the centre of the screen i.e. it's worth fewer and fewer points as it covers across the screen. We have instructions here. Uh, destroy, destroy all the submarines within 100 seconds. Keys are 1 is left, 2 is right, 0 is fire, and Andy starts off with the high score of 15. And press any key to begin. Nice to have a bit of instructions. Again, this game fits into 16k quite comfortably. Screen clears. We have a nice clear sky, nice clear sea. A late evening sun and the time is clicking at the top. We we'll, uh, we control the red destroyer and we get to move left and right and drop our depth charges when we get a successful hit. We have sound and animation. On the right hand side we get a lower score. One point. Two points for over there. Three points for here. And four points for over on the extreme left. Obviously, the further left you are, the less notice you have. And obviously, as the submarines are of varying depths, the lower ones you have more time to uh, deploy, but it takes more time for the depth charge to sink. On the top, though, you have very little time to react when they're directly underneath you. The time is ticking. It's really rather, rather pleasant. You get a nice animation. It moves quickly. Nice UDG. Slightly smaller UDGs for the submarines than uh, some of the other games on this uh, video. It's a two character UDG. But you also get two characters for the explosion and three for the ship and one for the depth charge. It's a nice barrel effect. Time's ticking up. But 74 seconds on the clock. This is all done via the, the system clock, via the pokes. Which is good because it doesn't matter how you uh, interfere with the game. That timer keeps ticking up even if you hold down the fire button. Which you can do. Another hit, thank you. 
Holding down the front, and there we are. My time's up, but I attain a fantastic score of 48 with a high score. We have a little high score table. We get to scroll the. Uh, we don't get to type in letters because that's le less uh, arcadey. Here we get to type, you know, scroll back and forth and select. And if you don't get the high score, so your time is up. A fantastic score the second time of only. 29 and the game says you're terrible at this you did not even beat the high score so i think that you can make this game even better though it's quite good as it is This is my improved version of James Mead's subhunt. As is traditional, we always have a loading screen to mask all our nonsense. And this loading screen I created with basic, a bit of basic program. And then I use the Hardman and Houston fill routine to fill it in. So essentially it is a submarine with a conning tower and the wires at the front and the back. And some exploding depth charges. Of course, I realised eventually I didn't need to do the uh, faffing around with print hash zero. I could have done use input to print the bottom two rows. And this one, I didn't use machine code. I just used the basic copying. I had some issues where I forgot I was in a 16K machine. I was trying to copy above, um, above 31,000, which doesn't really work very well. So we've now got loaded the screen, we've got the Jonathan Coldwell poke, we're now loading the font and a bit of machine code which is going into the print buffer, which is convenient because we don't have a lot of code, um, a lot of room for manoeuvre in terms of memory in 16k, but the print buffer is free because we're never going to use the printer. Game has now loaded and off we go. Bottom of the screen you've got two rows of yellow, here's a submarine, submarine now fires missiles with a little bit of sound. I noticed there wasn't really a seabed. In fact, there was. He created a red seabed by using input and just empty quotation marks. But I thought, make it clear with a nice yellow seabed. Both dropping depth charges and missiles now have a little beepy noise. When submarines enter or leave the play area, there's a chance they may play a little bit of the music from Das Boot. It seemed appropriate. We also have a count at the top for the number of submarines we've missed. And that there is a hit with the code ZAPPO from E French of Lancaster. And that is in the print buffer. And there we go. we've missed there. Once you get 10 missed submarines, it's game over. The tune from the left and right sub is slightly different. But also on the top right, we've got a fuel gauge. I noticed that evading the missiles was actually quite easy, unless the submarines were very close to the surface. So you only have 20 moves to represent emergency manoeuvres. Once that's exhausted, you can't move until you're destroyed. So make it a little bit harder. Obviously, adding sound makes the game slower. Probably why Mr. Mead didn't do it in the first place. However, with the explosion, the game paused while you flashed anyway. So here I'm moving and fuel's going down. And the missile's going up. Currently missed five subs. So remember, you lose the game if you get ten missed submarines now or you run out of lives. It's still, a, a, still an attack, a score attack game. And losing your ship, it's a much bigger deal now. It actually makes a big noise rather than flashing for a moment then you wouldn't, sometimes don't even notice, especially if you haven't moved. There's no great advantage to moving. The ships, the subs come from either side. Therefore, it's hard to know where, where to be to get the most shot. But essentially, when you're at our lives, or oh, add one more missed sub, you're dead, 
get a high score possibly at another game. John Hall's Subhunt Deluxe. This is the smallest of the three programs, about 2.5k of basics, easily fits in. But what can we do to make it better? I've added some extra UDGs, which then had to involve extensive rewriting of the display code and also the hit detection. I noticed once you loaded the game, it instantly turned off the nice font I put in, or pretty much instantly, which is a shame because I like the nice font. It does that because it uses screen string to see what's going on. But you can't use screen string if you're trying to detect user-defined graphics because screen string doesn't, doesn't know what the hell they are. So instead, I'm using attribute byte instead, which then involves um, basically looking for is the square we've hit uh, black ink rather than blue ink for the water. And that works fine, except you then have to add in extra code to turn the ink black and to turn the ink blue again afterwards, which then means to cope with some errors which I can't quite get around, I've had to make the viewing port a bit wider to solve um, issues where the string gets a bit out of control because it's, it's, it's then of variable length. It might have control characters and you can't print control characters. I left the sound mostly as it was, except I added in a klaxon sound that then didn't quite work because I moved from 64, 48k land to 16k land. But it's because it's, I think it's contended memory or something. It then changes the timing and basically makes it sound weird. So that's now an explosion of sound. The, as you'll see, the periscope now goes up and down. It should be a bit more easy to play. The uh, klaxon sound is from a thing called roller coaster, which I shall talk about in the accompanying video. It takes about two minutes to load now. And once loaded, we see the viewport is a lot wider. That's just to cover up my uh, problems with the bug, problems with the uh, string getting too long, because the middle bits is a very, very long string. It's a very long string of waves, which occasionally, part way through it, contains a submarine. I've extended this to, rather than have one long string, we actually have three long strings, some of which may contain bits of periscope. The up periscope and up periscope going down. Which required us, us to have separate UGGs for the top of the periscope, the middle bit and the bottom bit. Going left to right is now a little bit easier, easier to control as well. And when you hit a submarine, you get different points depending on how high up the scope is. So if you hit this periscope of the submarine at its very highest point, you get five points. Intermediate, you get three. And just out of the water, you get one. So at a bit of risk reward. But it's still quite tricky because the boat does bob around quite a lot. The best thing to do is if, it's, if it disappears as weight, so it always appears in the same place. Which is a very poor form for submarines, but that's just the way the strings are put together. So it's a very long string which is scrolling backwards and forth and is substringing it. Occasionally it gets a bit weird because we're adding in not just one character, but potentially five characters. It gets a little bit twitchy. Originally it coped with this by not scrolling the very right hand character. Once it added in the five characters it just looked weird because the, some of the cedars didn't move. This still all runs in 16k. With the roller coaster, font, uh, roller coaster machine code. Being something I'd explain in the accompanying video. Extra UDGs. And a change to how the scoring works, a change to how the detection works. I'd admit the track of the our torpedo one pixel shorter, otherwise it made the square we're drawing into blue, and therefore we couldn't detect it, which is a bit of a problem. But it's a simple game, it's good fun, it's good good, good fun for a laugh. You can see that it's uh it really is quite easy to type in. And just, just lots of stuff builds um, a, st a string A string is going to combine into a B string, which then may have a, an extra bit of submarine added in to form C string. And of course, I've done the same thing with the two rows above, which now can, can contain bits of submarine. Left a bit. Fire. 
a vase that then contained the extended periscope and the top of the periscope. Four shots left. There's no time limit. Take, take all the time you like to shoot, shoot these submarines. Always appear in the same place. Three shots left. The maximum score you can get from a submarine is five. The score variable is held in a thing called hits. I then change it to give you more points the higher up it goes. So where is the submarine? Ah, there it is. Oh, two shots left. Can I get it? Can I get it? Can I get it? Can I get one? Can I? Come on, come on, get it. Come on, can I get you? And that's a big no. That was John Hall's Subhunt Deluxe. So this is Andrew Turner's sub hunt, Deluxe. As is, as is traditional, we've got a loading screen and we've got the font. I haven't used any machine code in this one. The game already came with sound, which I thought was adequate for our purposes. And also there wasn't a lot of room. I had some issues with version, I think version three or four of this, where I tried to load the game with the font and it instantly said out of memory. So to go through and do the traditional tricks of turning zeros and ones into variables, which saves about five bytes for each, which wasn't too bad. The other thing I, other thing I could have done to save memory is to put the user-defined graphic generation code, of, of which I used about 10. I could put that into the loader program, because that's a series of data statements, which do eat up a, a fair chunk of memory. But my simple additions added about 600 bytes to the code, and that was enough to blow it out of the water. Excuse the pun. So, it's loaded. One thing I noticed with the Jonathan Coldwell poke is unless you turn it off, you're better to clear the screen an extra time once you load, otherwise you'll this screen loaded in the wrong colours. Welcome to Sub Hunt. Navigate your destroyer over there. The addition being, watch out for aircraft. I added something in the code. This is as we have so far. At the bottom of the screen you've got the seabed, which is two lines. But instead of just plain yellow, we've got red and green in a dithered pan to represent a muddy sea floor of the North Sea. You already have sound. It all looks fine so far. We've got ones and zeros. That's pretty good. The one thing I added was, I noticed there was no opponent in the game. So you couldn't actually die. So I said, watch out for airplanes. If you remain still for too long, which is quite likely, an airplane flies above and drops a bomb on you. That's using the over routine to basically, you can display stuff over what's already there. If a bomb hits you, you lose all your score. We don't die, but you lose the score gets reset to zero. It's not guaranteed it will hit you. As it flies over, there's a 10% chance each square it might drop a bomb. But obviously you're three squares wide, so if it hits you, you lose your score. And then it goes, goes away again. So it encourages you to keep moving. So you can't just sit in the same place. It's quite easy to stay in the same place. Once you find the sweet spot, so you drop the bomb in the wrong place. And again, it's missed us. We're safe for now. Okay, keep racking up the score. I had to change the code slightly. When the submarine was at the highest level of the sea, you couldn't actually hit it. So I made it so it never appeared there. And because I added something on the bottom, it did a check for, is the, is the square... Is the square below or next to the depth charge um, empty? If not, we've got a hit. But suddenly the muddy sea floor is not empty. Therefore, I'd have changed it to be if it's not empty and we're above a certain level. So that's fixed as well. Time's up. Oh, we've, got, we've now got a score of 30, which is the highest score. I extended the highest score table just so I can put in my own name. So rather than four characters for Andy, we can have eight for Snorkers, which was relatively simple to do to expand it over. Just a bit of fun. I also noticed there was code in the original game 
which seemed to imply the existence of a do you want to play again screen, which was never ever called. So I added that in as well. So whether you win or, win or lose, do you want another go? Yes, no, come on, come on, do it. If you say no, the game mocks you. And to make Ponder happy, I've added a go to the end so you don't get a stop. You get a go, oh, okay, right at the end of the code. 